Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Thank you so much for joining us um, into uh, another episode uh, on the topic of slavery in Islam. We know that this is a tough topic. We know that this is a topic that might cause some of you to grieve. Maybe some of you will be offended. We want to apologize in advance, uh, myself and my guest here, Dr. Bill Warner. Really, all we're doing is we're putting the spotlight on these tough topics under the umbrella of political Islam and also providing you with the sources where this came from. Now, you are free to go and investigate on your own, obviously. You don't have to listen to us. You don't have to pay attention to anything we're giving you. But technically speaking, if you are honest about this and go and search it for yourself, you will reach the same conclusion that we're reaching. And it's simply this. A religion that claims to provide equality to mankind should never endorse teaching as the one that we will be sharing with you. That's the simple underlining, basically, conclusion here that we want everyone to ask and hopefully reach as well. Bill, last time we talked about slavery in general, uh, in, in general, under Islam. And I want to just mention something here today. I mean, one of the things we talked about is that um, slavery in Islam or the doctrine of slavery allows the capture of women, even underage women, mm -hmm. and they can become your property to the point that you can even sleep with them technically mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, today I want to share like a tradition by Muhammad where he was told by uh, his soldiers that they have captured some slave women and they were sleeping with them in the battlefield, but they didn't want him to get pregnant, you know, so they were basically, you know, exercising some cautious and they went to the prophet, they were troubled by uh, the practice, you know, that they were doing, like, uh, they're not going all the way, technically speaking, to get them pregnant. And the prophet actually was surprised that they would do something like this. And he says, enjoy, technically speaking, if Allah ordained for you to have a child, he's going to make it happen. You know, so in other words, uh, you know, don't rob yourself from the joy of having full-blown sexual relationship with them. I remember the first time I read that hadith, I was like, what? Did it say what I thought it said? And yes, it did. It did. It did, absolutely. I mean, I'm even embarrassed to mention it, but uh, there is no escape from that. This is, uh, by the way, a tradition that is found, for instance, in Sahih Bukhari. You can go to volume 7, uh, Hadith 137. Uh, I'm going to read it. You know, this is what it says, although uh, it's not my practice to get into topics like this usually, but I just want to read it for the sake of people understanding what I mean by that. Narrated Abu al-Khudri, okay? We got female captives in the war booty, and we used to do coitus interruptus, okay, with them. So we asked Allah's messenger about it, and he says, do you really do that? Repeating the question thrice. There is no soul that is destined to exist, but will come into existence till the day of resurrection. Conclusion? Have Adam. Do what you have mm. to do. You know, that's your duty, basically. Um, By the way, what was the one person who can't be a slave? Another Muslim. Uh, under the Sharia law, of course, you cannot enslave a Muslim, for right. sure. As a Muslim, you cannot enslave a Muslim. Exactly. That's what it says. So there's only one way out of being a slave, which is to be a Muslim. Which means, if you're not a Muslim, you're what? An open season, right. technically speaking. Best of luck for you. We'll be praying for you. Right. <laughs> and is that what ISIS practice, basically? ISIS, I find, practices pure Islam. Uh, you know, if I remember right... Uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, if I say it correctly, uh, was had his PhD from Al-Azhar University. In Islamic studies, by the in way. In Islamic studies. Yeah. So if a man who has a PhD from Al-Azhar, and we ought to explain that Al-Azhar is sort of like the Harvard or the Yale of Islam. That's right. That is, this is not just some small community college. That's right. It's been around forever. So, Which is, I find it amusing when people try to say, well, that's not what Islam teaches. You know, this ISIS is not Islamic. If ISIS is not Islamic, then you know nothing about Islam. That's pretty much what it is. Yes. Yeah, it is the purest form of Islam, which they proudly say. That's, that's what they say. I mean, we're imitating Muhammad and his companions. That's right. And they're very clear about it. They, and they do a good job. They say, I mean, our way is the prophetic way, meaning yes. the way of the prophet. Exactly. We, you want to know what the, how the prophet practiced in Islam in the 7th century? Come and join us. 
I mean, that was one of their mottos to promote, basically, you know, people to come and join him. And scores of young men joined him, and women, for that matter. The women thing was the one that amazed me most. Right. Why? Because they know that's, remember, pleasing your husbands, you know, uh, obeying the prophet, doing what Allah ordained for you, that will open the door for you to go to paradise. Which is the ultimate goal here. That's right. That is, we emphasize how disturbing it is for Islam to be in this generation or in this in the life of the living. But remember, their key goal is paradise comes after you die. We right. love. So this means the motivation is very strong, but it's one that leads to some very bad results. Absolutely. Let's keep going here and take a look at, you know, other hadith, this time from Abu Dawood, you know, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood. And it's talking about slavery. For instance, in uh, one of these Sunan, uh, volume 2, chapter 597, it says, On a man who beats his slave while he is in a sacred state, meaning uh, going to Hajj. You know, this is the, you know, the chapter deals with that topic. If you're going to Hajj, right, you know, you're dressed up in your white, basically sacred clothes, and you're beating your slave. Let's see what uh, the Prophet says. Abu Bakr began to beat his slave while the Apostle of Allah was smiling and saying, look at this man who is in the sacred state. What is he doing? Okay, what is he doing? And then Abu Bakr was beating his slave to teach him sense of responsibility. So the Prophet wasn't actually outraged. No. He's just saying, look, you know, I mean, that's, that's how you ought to do it, right? Again, and this is Sunnah. This is a perfect example of a perfect man leading the perfect life. That's right. A Sunnah basically is how to peril someone's action, right? And it's called the Sunnah of the Prophet or Sunnah of the Prophet uh, or his companions. In this case, Abu Bakr was one of his companions. So if you want to be a good Muslim, here is an example for you. Now, let me ask this question, folks. What's the point behind a hadith like this if you tell me that Islam abolished slavery? Why is it still there? What's the message that we're trying to learn from it? And how could you abolish part of the Sunnah anyway? If, if slavery is part of Islam, according to both Allah and Muhammad, how can you abolish it? And why would you want to abolish it? What I'm, you know, that, that's pretty much exactly the point. And thank you for bringing it up, uh, Bill. You know, we're asking a, a, a sensitive and logical question. If you're convinced that it's been abolished, then shame on you for leaving something like this. And because it's very troubling, remove it. But you know why it's there, Bill, right? Because at some point, Islam is going to domineer another area, and they have to learn how to practice these kind of teachings. ISIS did it perfectly just recently. Mm -hmm. Because they felt like they are starting a new caliphate, they had to practice these kind of things. What's the story with the Yazidi woman? Why are they enslaved? Where did they get this idea from, Bill? From Muhammad. And the Quran. And the Quran, yes. They were practicing the same thing that was taught. When a Yazidi woman would say, and they raped me. Well, you know what? In the mind of the jihadi, that wasn't rape. It was sacred practice. It's my reward, right? You know, exactly. you're my slave. You're my, what my right hand possessed. Therefore, I'm doing what the Quran and Muhammad told me. You see, people don't understand these things. By the way, we're dealing here basically with jihad and capturing other people. But the practice of jihad does not only have to be done by Islamic State and, uh, and uh, other such groups. It can also be done by one person on the street. If your purpose in attacking a, non, a kafir woman is for the purpose of jihad, that is dominating her in the name of Islam, then you have your own war booty right there in front of you with one person. That is, it's not just groups of armies that get to... Oh, that's right. It's like hunting, right? You exactly. Know, you go and you get a rabbit and you get, uh, you know, a deer or whatever here. Hey, you find one, it's, she's yours. You're now, your right hand now possesses her. That is, you've taken her by force. And that's, by the way, the stories that I used to um, get exposed to and read. Uh, you know, you mentioned Dabek, of course, that, uh, that's the, uh, you know, magazine, if you wish, the online magazine for ISIS. But other reports, you know, from even missionaries in there or those who flee, that, yeah, th there'll be usually one or two ISIS fighters and they will capture a woman because they, she just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, right. you know. And in his mind, hey, you're mine now. Exactly. Well, following the rules of the game, he's exactly correct. That is something you see consistently. I find that when people talk about Islam, the jihadis are much better with their doctrine than the average person is. That's right. That's why they're jihadis, and that's why they're willing to go to the extreme 
that they're going for, mm -hmm. you know. So back again to my question. Why is it that we have such teachings in the Quran or the Hadith unless that there is a time and a place when this will be practiced? That's the only reason why it's still there. Right. By the way, let's talk about some a special class of slaves, which are the black slaves. In Africa, many slaves were taken, but the complaint was you're never supposed to take another Muslim as a slave. But the Sharia courts are filled in Africa with black jurists saying, hey, our jihadis are capturing and enslaving Muslims, which is wrong and must not be done. They didn't say it was wrong to make slaves. It was that you're not supposed to capture Muslims. But of course, a good slave trader, if he's shy on Kafir slaves, he's got a business to run, can't blame him for that, so he takes whatever the nearest by, and if they're a Muslim, whatever Allah provides. Yep, I mean, that's that's the thing, you know, it's it's very troubling when you read things like this. Um, um, when, when we deal with the contractual obligation to a slave, for instance, this is what the Hadith says. In Surah Abu Dawood, uh, Hadith number 3499 or 3500, it says, the contractual obligation of a slave is three days. If he finds defect in the slave within three days, he may return it without any evidence. There is a return policy, you know, Bill. I didn't I did know not about know that. This hadith. I did not know that there is a return policy. I mean, this is. I mean, how uh, generous. Here is what's so funny. Now, uh, a Muslim clerk would say, "See the mercy of Islam. It's <laughs> it's telling you to return the slave if you find defects. Right. You know, whatever that might be. Actually, if he finds a defect after three days." He will be required to produce evidence that the slave had the defect when he brought it. So now it gets a little bit more difficult, but you may get by. So all you have to do is probably find two liars to lie with you and right. everything will be fine. By the way, I'm reminded, what was Muhammad's occupation before he became a prophet of Allah? He was a businessman. And I notice that we see a certain business attitude towards many things. The longest verse, by the way, in the Quran is about business law. Oh, there's a lot of them, by the way, in the Quran. I mean, it, they, they go into details, instructions, percentages, you right. know, and days and, and numbers and everything. So either Allah was a businessman or Muhammad was a businessman. I would argue it's both. <laughs> I mean, because it's one and the same, technically speaking. Oh, what by the way, let me interrupt. Do you know where we get the name slave in English? Where? From the Slav. So many of them were taken as slaves. Oh, I see. I see. Interesting. So a little historical mm. bit there. Cool. Well, uh, not cool, of course, to enslave anybody. <laughs> um, uh, what about another collection of hadiths known as Muwatta ibn Malik? Okay, this is ibn Malik, the founder of the Maliki school, by the way, of Sharia, okay, whose student happened to be Shafi'i, who is the author, technically speaking, of the Alliance of the Travelers. Right. In fact, uh, could we show the image of that book that we keep talking about, the Alliance of the Travelers? Here it is. It, the Reliance, I'm sorry, I said Alliance. The Reliance of the Traveler, which is uh, Umdat As-Salik, technically speaking. And here, this particular book, which, by the way, done by Nuh, uh, uh, and then the initials, and then Killer. Uh, Nuh Killer basically took the Shafi'i teachings and they translated it and did also some studies on it. This is really readily available for anyone to have. It's talking about one of the many schools that uh, uh, Sunni Sharia law has. And in there, you know, Bill, you said your finding was 30% of this was religious, right. right? And the rest of it was practical, right? Yes, very practical, arranging from good advice. There's, there's some good advice within it, but there's also some advice which I don't care for at all. But the reason we need to, this is getting a sidestep off into Sharia, but Sharia is not like British, I mean, Eng I'll say it in a moment, Catholic canon law, nor is it like Jewish law, because Jewish law says that a Jew can't eat, ba eat bacon, but Sharia law says nobody eats bacon. That is, the non-believer is there. But slavery is also within the reliance of the traveler, but it's deceptive. It says, it doesn't translate what's there, and it says, oh, this was abolished, Islam was the first people to abolish slavery, which in fact is a lie. It is not true. The people, the religion that abolished slavery were the Christians. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, we brought up the uh, reliance of the tra travelers simply because the Shafi'i, who happened to be the student of Ibn Malik. Uh, now, let's see what uh, Muwatta Ibn Malik or Imam Malik says about slavery. For instance, in chapter 368 in there, 
It talks about those who takes the property of a slave when he is freed. So there is an entire chapter that deals with that. There's another chapter that deals with slaves who cannot be set free in the obligatory freeing of slave. Chapter 390, for instance, on the conditional sale of a slave girl. I mean, it gets into, like you said, business transactions, Nitty contracts, gritty. exactly, and telling you specifically how you ought to do things. Now, if somebody comes back and say, well, that all was canceled, show me the proof that it was canceled. It's not there. In fact, you know, there is one uh, hadith here, if I can find it. Uh, a woman came, basically, and told Muhammad, hey, Prophet, you know, I emancipated, basically, my slave girl. And he's like, you could have sold her. Ha! <laughs> A businessman. Does this sound like somebody who cared about the freedom of people? No. You could have sold her and made money. It's a business deal. So that's the sad thing that we're dealing with. You know, let me just summarize basically, uh, you know, as a conclusion to our series, um, some of the rights of slaves under Islam. But before I do that, you know, Bill, do you have anything else you want to cover? Because I want to make sure we tackle the there's, issues. There's one last thing, which is an interesting historical thing, which was the Mosque of Medina always had African guardians who were castrated. They were eunuchs. As a matter of fact, it was the custom of the Arabs to have all black slaves who were male have their gonads and penis removed. Right, and they would do it on the slave ships. In fact, I mean, speaking of that, I want to say that there was this man that made a journey almost 50, 60 years ago, and he went and visited different places, including, you know, for instance, Saudi Arabia. His name is Sean uh, O'Callaghan, you know, toured the Middle East and Africa, uh, basically visiting slave markets. And it was recent. And he discovered, you know, basically in Djibouti, there was some stuff going on. In Aden, there's some stuff. Aden, basically in Yemen, South Yemen. In Saudi Arabia, he writes, he estimated about 450,000 slaves. We're talking a couple of decades ago. Right. By the way, the historical records are there for business, which is, do you know the price of the most expensive slave? Who was the most expensive slave you could buy? No. A white woman. And why is this? Who was Muhammad's favorite sex slave? Basically, a woman, Miriam, who is described as being Maria, fair. Maria, the Coptic, yep. Yes, exactly. Which fair means here means light-skinned. So since Muhammad's favorite sex slave was light-skinned, what does the Sunnah imply? Well, that your favorite sex slave ought to be a white woman, which means her price is elevated. Just a little historical detail. If you're a white woman watching and listening, I don't know what to tell you other than just pray and hope nothing like this would happen in an area where you're living. Because I'm telling everyone, only few in the Islamic community who adhere to the teaching of Islam, the Quran, the Prophet, Sharia, will end up enforcing these teachings. It took a handful of fighters to establish what we call today the Caliphate or ISIS. It wasn't all of the Muslims in the world, just a handful that they have terrorized the world. And by the way, the ideology that caused ISIS to rise, alive and kicking. And another group will go ahead and capitalize on that ideology at some point. I'm not trying to scare anyone, I'm being realistic. Being very realistic. The doctrine is unchangeable. The doctrine is there. It is not... We, let's remind people what we're talking about. We're talking about Islam. We're not talking about Muslims. That's right. That's Muslims important. can change. Muslims can reform. Muslims can do anything they want to do. And they you're going to find a lot Muslim. of wonderful Muslims, I'm sure. I mean, we're not saying anything about them, but no. the ideology... The ideology. Muhammad doesn't change and Allah doesn't change stays the same. That flies in the face of Islam if you say the Quran could be modified or the Hadith could be reduced or edited. In fact, the Turkish government at some point attempted to do something like this by uh, uh, kind of like republishing the Hadith by abolishing some of the what we call Hadith that doesn't apply, technically speaking. And I can tell you that hell broke loose against that idea. That was before the current Turkish government, of course. But nevertheless, such an idea did not work well, even though the highest authority in a government decided to do something like this. And the Tur Turkish government has its own Islamic weight. After all, that's where the Ottoman Empire came from. So they feel like they have the same kind of obligation and weight towards the teaching of Islam. All that to say, let us conclude by uh, overviewing some of the supposed rights of slaves under Islam. For instance, 
Muslim men were allowed to have sex anytime with female slaves. Chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 29, chapter 33, verse 9. These are the rights of slaves, by the way. Slaves are helpless before their masters as idols are before God. That's the comparison, meaning that you cannot speak or say anything. You're just an idol. Remember what an idol looked like? Can't do anything. Chapter 16, verse 77 affirms this. According to Islamic tradition, people at the time of their capture were either to be killed or enslaved shows you that they were at the bottom of the barrel, basically. According to Islamic jurisprudence, slaves were merchandise. In other words, you'll find them in Sharia law under business transactions, technically speaking. It is permissible under Sharia law to whip and lash slaves anywhere, anytime. According to Islam, a Muslim could not be put to death for murdering a slave. That's true. Yeah. Forgot about that. In other words, the slave is just a property. Right. I mean, can you be put to death to, for killing a camel? No. You can pay maybe a restitution for the camel owner, but hey, it's a camel. It's a camel. So that's basically, that's equality, right? According to Islam, the testimony of slaves is not admissible. In fact, if you bring like two slave men, ten slave men, as if they're not even there, it's null, zero. You cannot really have their testimony at all. According to Islamic jurisprudence, slaves cannot choose their own marriage mate. Ibn Hazm, for instance, one of those philosophers and Islamic you know, uh, theologians is the one who wrote about that in his writing in volume seven, part nine. And one last thing to cover here, according to Islamic jurisprudence, slaves can be forced to marry who their masters want. Malik ibn Anas, who is the muatta that was written by him, who is the founder of the Maliki school of Sharia, wrote about this in volume two, page 155. And in relationship to this, by the way, if a slave marries anyone without the permission of his master or her master, the marriage is nullified. Mm -hmm. So who has the right to say you can marry or not? Your master. And Any yet, last thoughts? Muslims have, the, have said many times is that the slavery of Islam was almost a benefit and a blessing, not like the ugly kind that we had here in America. Theirs was somehow or another virtuous and good. That's right. That's right. Well, folks, um, you can see that I can keep on going, but we want to slow it down. It's enough that our stomach is turning already over these kind of topics. But at some point, Bill, I would love for us to do much longer series, taking it one topic at a time, because we want to educate our uh, audience and we want to bring the reliance of the traveler and read from there and show images from the teachings that are found in there. I think Any last comments? I think it's very important that we understand the historic roots of this because right now the history we have of slavery simply is, shall we say, incomplete. And a half-truth is not true. So these things that we're talking about are very important because one of the things here in America is, is that Muslims tell black people, Yours is, your natural religion is Islam. Christianity is the religion of the white man. Well, taking that and looking at what happens with the slave trade out of Africa, that doesn't seem to work out so well, does it? And we need to know how it does work out based on facts. Absolutely, and uh, we want to again apologize for any material that you may have perceived to be offensive, but please don't take it on us. We're only reporting what these sources are saying, and we've given you references so you can go and inspect it for yourself. Until we meet again in another series, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video. And we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.